Hi everyone, um, I'm Ruth, I'm the Curator of Greek and Roman Art at the Michael C. Carlos Museum at Emory University here in Atlanta. Um, but I'm talking to you from my apartment um, because we're continuing to work from home uh, for the protection of our community. Um, as Emory approaches commencement next week, I've been thinking a lot about the um, perhaps surprising relationship between education and social distancing in the Roman world. Um, because if you were a wealthy Roman, perhaps a member of the political elite, then the pursuit of a cultural education, specifically in the art, literature and philosophy of ancient Greece, um, went hand in hand with a kind of active withdrawal from society. Um, and this was in the larger pursuit of something that the Romans called Otium, and that we translate as uh, refined leisure time. Um, and this was in opposition to negotium, literally the absence of otium or business. Um, and so uh, I wanted to share with you some objects from the Carlos that, that help to illustrate um, Roman approaches to otium and to social distancing, which was not only a way of life for many wealthy Romans, but was something that was cultivated very much as an art form with a whole set of uh, criteria um, and conditions. So I wanted to share some images with you in the hope that they might um, inspire you to find some relaxation time as well. So, First and foremost, otium in the Roman world um, required fresh air and tranquility and an escape from the distractions of, of business and the city. Um, and this is because for, for many wealthy Romans, the home was not a private place in the way that we think of it today, um, but it operated much more as a kind of public office and meeting room where um, supporters and dependents would gather on a, on a daily basis to meet with, um, with their patron. Um, and so Rome's elites would withdraw from the city to their country villas, um, where they would exercise, where they would entertain friends, and where they would really kind of develop their um, musical and intellectual capabilities. And these Villas were often um, luxuriously decorated. Um, and I'm showing you here um, a section of uh, pavement um, made using a technique called opus sectile, um, which basically involves um, tiles of differently colored stones being arranged in these really kind of bold geometric patterns. Um, and this example here from the Carlos Museum um, includes this wonderful yellow marble, which is called Giallo Antico, um, which comes from Numidia, um, as well as a type of stone called Africano, which is the black stone with the kind of mottled uh, red and beige patterns, which comes from Teos in Asia Minor. And because these materials are being uh, quarried and sourced from across the Roman Empire, they were incredibly expensive, um, which means that we often only find um, opus septile flooring in the most sumptuous um, of Roman residences. As well as um, resituating themselves in uh, their country homes, um, Romans would also change their clothing um, to help them get into the mood for otium. Um, this is a statue of a, um, a Roman man wearing a toga. Um, this is the kind of business suit of its day, um, but it's also uh, an item of clothing that Roman men wore to really kind of outwardly define themselves as Roman. So even though this statue has lost its head, which would have been an individualized portrait that would have helped us to identify this individual, we can still tell quite a lot about him from what he's wearing. So the toga tells us he is Roman. Um, it tells us he's probably a member of um, 
uh, perhaps the political elite. He's certainly high up in the social hierarchy um, because he's wearing a ring, um, which unfortunately you can't see in this photo, but he's wearing a ring on his left hand. Um, and he also would originally have been holding a scroll in that left hand. And that tells us that perhaps he's a high ranking official. So this is a man in his business dress. Um, but what we know from uh, Roman literary sources is that some men, when they uh, withdrew to their country villas, they swapped their togas, so this large, heavy fabric that, that really kind of um, is, is wrapped around the body, um, and they would swap that toga for Greek dress. Now, this is another headless statue. Um, it's actually... Um, uh, a fragment from a, a grave stone and it's it's a relief carving but very high relief which is why it almost looks like it's um, fully in the round um, but I hope that you can see that it also shows um, a male figure this time seated um, and he's dressed very differently he's wearing um, a loose fitting mantle which is kind of wrapped around his legs and his waist and then pulled up over his shoulder and this is kind of characteristically um, Greek style dress. Now you may wonder why um, Romans chose to dress in a Greek style um, when they were relaxing um, in their villas um, and this has to do with the with the reverence really that Rome afforded to Greek culture. Um, essentially looking Greek uh, was a way for Romans to demonstrate their sort of cultured sophistication and their, um, and their education. And it also helped create a kind of atmosphere for refined, le refined leisure time um, that these Romans were looking to achieve in their villas. Now this um, sort of pursuit of Greek style extended beyond what Roman people would wear um, to the objects that they used to decorate their villas with. And in particular, um, these villas would be filled um, both in, inside the building and also in the garden um, with Greek style art, um, sometimes genuine antiques that had been um, that had been brought into Italy from Greece, um, but sometimes also copies of famous Greek artworks or even new creations that kind of use the style and the motifs of Greek, um, of Greek objects. What I'm showing you here is, um, is a marble head that comes from a sculpture that was made in the second century AD um, and it depicts an athlete. Um, and it copies a very celebrated statue um, of a victorious athlete known as the Diadumenos or the ribbon binder. Um, and this original statue was made in Greece in the fourth century BC by an artist called Praxiteles. And this was an incredibly famous um, sculpture that is, is replicated um, uh, in many different forms, on different scales, um, and sometimes in different media. Um, and it showed that athlete tying a ribbon around his head, which was a mark of, of victory in an athletic competition. Now, the original statue would have um, stood in the sanctuary where those games had taken place as a kind of permanent memorial um, and commemoration of that, of that victory. Um, but what happens in Rome is that copies of this statue are displayed in very different contexts. And it's quite possible that, that the statue to which this head um, originally belonged was displayed in um, perhaps in the garden or perhaps in the gymnasium um, of a private residence um, where it took on quite a different function. Um, we know that uh, one of the activities that took place in, in Roman villas that was part of the kind of pursuit of, of otium was physical exercise. So in that context, this statue becomes a kind of um, an archetype, a model um, for its viewer to sort of aspire to. Um, but it also allows uh, its owner to demonstrate their knowledge of 
of Greek art um, by showing off this, this copy of a very famous um, Greek image. Other ways in which um, Romans really kind of cultivated this refined and relaxed sensibility was through um, the study of Greek literature and philosophy. Um, and so they would dedicate their time um, to reading, to quiet thinking, perhaps also to debates um, and to displays of their learning. Um, and so what I'm showing you here um, on, the, on the left is a, is a small head um, depicting the poet Homer. Um, Homer who, you know, we believe composed um, the Iliad and the Odyssey, um, these two great poems that really were the kind of benchmark um, and the touchstone of Greek literature. Um, that any kind of well-educated and, and cultured Roman um, would, would have known and would have been able to recite. Um, and Homer's stories were often used um, as kind of moral guides. So you might debate the various virtues um, of different characters and events. On the right um, of this head, um, I've included a, uh, an intaglio gemstone. Um, so this in reality is only about a quarter of an inch um, in height by about the same in width. Um, it's a tiny stone garnet um, and it's been carved um, with a portrait of um, probably the philosopher Socrates. So you can see him in, in profile. Um, Socrates was famously quite ugly. Um, so you can see that this, this head is balding, um, it's got a kind of pug snubbed nose, um, kind of wild hair. Um, and this is because Socrates was, was sort of believed to be um, of such pure mind um, in contrast to his kind of less appealing um, physique. Um, now this stone may have been set into a ring um, that would have been uh, that would have been worn um, and in that context it sort of provides a little uh, reminder um, to its viewer perhaps um, of Socrates teachings as well as a way of kind of displaying um, perhaps your adherence to his um, particular philosophies. Another philosopher that was incredibly popular um, during the first centuries BC and AD in Rome was another Greek philosopher called Epicurus. Um, now Epicurus uh, taught that um, the goal in life really was to achieve a state of ataraxia um, or, or freedom from mental and physical pain, a kind of, um, a kind of tranquility of the mind. Um, and Epicurus taught that, that this state of tranquility and, and relaxation um, could be achieved through, through rest, through quiet time, but really importantly through um, a form of social distancing by withdrawing from the distractions um, and, and the toil of, of, of business and of everyday life um, to spend time uh, in nature. And he really advocated the importance of um, and the value of uh, conversations with friends, of having enough food and drink not to be thirsty or hungry, um, but really of kind of spending time, um, quiet time in nature. Um, and so many Roman villas incorporated large gardens um, where you could sort of really um, step away um, from, from, from the difficulties of ordinary life to find peace. Um, and so I wanted to end um, with this object, which is, um a drinking cup it's made of silver and it would originally have had two handles um 
at the rim on either side. Um, and you can see that it's um, decorated very finely with um, scrolling foliage, these kind of wonderful tendrils um, on which birds are perching. And it's really kind of um, evoking this idea of the kind of the plenty and the peace um, and the kind of wonderment of, of nature, um, albeit made into a kind of luxury product that can be enjoyed in your sort of sumptuous villa. All of these objects are on display um, in the Carlos Museum. Um, and I hope very much that um, you'll be able to come and visit them in person soon. Um, but in the meantime, I hope that they have inspired you um, to find some some tranquility um, and some relaxation uh, in art and in reading, um, but most importantly in nature. So continue to be safe and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.